So today I want to discuss three things. One, should RVers be required to have a CDL license? Two, I want to talk about pre-trip inspections, but not so much from your standard typical RV pre-trip inspection, more like from a commercial driver's license standpoint, pre-trip inspection. And three, I don't know about you guys, but I have seen a lot of trees at the ends of sites at RV campgrounds that have been rubbed. And I want to talk about what's causing that rub and maybe give you guys a tip to stop rubbing on those trees when you're pulling out because I don't think it's grizzly bears that are doing it. Oh, and by the way, it's kind of creepy that you're underneath the hood of my truck, but let's roll. Okay, so we have a lot to get to today, lots to discuss. First of all, we're gonna talk about pre-trip inspections. We're gonna talk about should RVers be required to get a CDL license. And then we're gonna talk about some driving tips. So we have a lot to get to, but before we get to all that, I just wanna start off with this. A lot of you have asked me, Michael, what kind of fuel mileage are you getting since you lifted the truck and put the new wheels and tires on? So, are you ready? Here we go. Drum roll. So from here, from North Carolina to Wisconsin was a 2,400 mile round trip and we ended up averaging 7.3 miles per gallon. Yeah. yeah! Yeah, I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> so we did drop. So, you know, I was getting somewhere between just nine to eight point something in between there before lifting the truck two inches in the front. Now we are getting 7.3 miles per gallon, which I figured it was gonna drop some it is what it is. It's the vehicle. We lifted it, so I get it. So there you go, guys. 7.3 is what we're getting. I'll say this of the ride. Much softer ride, not as firm as the Continental tires and the Alcoa rims. So we didn't get quite as much bounce as we usually get. And actually, we don't get quite as much noise either. So, so there's the give and the take uh, of each of those things. Overall, am I still happy with the decision that I made? Absolutely. Yeah, I really love the look. And speaking of that, hey, I want to say this. A shout out to all of the new subscribers to our channel. Thank you so much for following along with us. We've really jumped over the last couple months. And thanks to you guys, we officially have our first video with over 100,000 views. And that's the video, is the F450 worth it? So thank you uh, for all of you who have commented on that and watched that, those of you who said it has helped you. Um, I'll put a link right here above. So those of you who haven't seen it, you can go back and watch it. Um, it was definitely a game changer. Okay, and thank you guys. All you guys who wrote in and said, can you say game changer one more time? I just did. <laughs> so no, thank you. I appreciate you guys for doing that. It's been awesome. So if you're here and you're new to our channel and you're watching this video, thank you. We're so glad that you stopped into our channel. I'm Michael, my wife's name is Chris. We created this YouTube channel, MK Experience, so we could share all of our RVing experiences, experience with the F450 and our golf cart and campground reviews. We created this channel just to share our thoughts and our experiences with you guys. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, we would love for you to do so. So please hit the subscribe button and then tap that notification button. And every time we post a video, you will be notified. So I want to talk about a basic pre-trip inspection. This is something that is so important and it's something that I've done since having a commercial driver's license. So I probably, I got into the, the habit of just doing it because it's something by law that I had to do before I left the yard every day. So I apply some of those same principles to our truck and fifth wheel that I did back when I drove commercial trucks. So I usually start on the driver's side and I'll start here at the front tire and I'm checking tread depth. Now, for me, it's kind of a no-brainer right now because we just got brand new tires, so I know that that's good, but maybe it's been a while since you've checked yours and maybe you're saying, well, is, what is the minimum amount tread depth that is safe? Well, they say that 430 seconds is the minimum amount on your steer tires in the front and 230 seconds on your rears. And if you don't have a gauge, there's a simple way to, to rectify that situation, and that is with the good old penny. Who said pennies were worthless? And that is the Abe Lincoln head check. So you take your penny, flip it upside down, stick it down in your tread. And if you can see Abe's head, you need new tread. That's kind of the rule. If you can't see his head, 
you know you're good. But just remember, if you're if you're if you see a little bit of his head, <laughs> you probably need to start looking uh, to get new tires. But that's just a good way to start there. Then from there, I'm just checking the fascia of the tire, looking for any cracks, uh, any gouges out of the rubber, and I kind of work my way in. So then I get to the rim and I'm checking out the rim. You know, sometimes you may have jumped a curb and you've never really looked at it. And if you have a bent rim, it's a really easy way for air to start leaking out. So you check your rim, kind of work your way inside again, and now you're going to check your valve stem and make sure there's no cracks, uh, make sure your valve, you know, your valve cover is on, uh, things of that nature. And then you get in narrower, and now we're to your lug nuts. And it's super important to check all your lug nuts before you take off. Uh, we carry a torque wrench with us when we go on the road. And I'm surprised, guys, you know, how much, and they're not super loose, but just a little bit, you know, kind of blows me away. So if you don't have one of those, I'll put a link down below uh, at our store. We have one that we like. You can check it out for yourself, but a super important thing to do. So as I'm working my way back, now I'm back to my dualies. I, I repeat the same procedure, so I'm not going to go through that, with the exception of I'm, I'm just looking in between. Uh, the dualies make sure they're not rubbing together. There's not anything kind of weird going on there And then at the same time, I'm kind of looking around at my leaf springs in the truck, right? Just kind of checking making sure everything's okay underneath there and Then as I work my way back if I'm coupled to the fifth wheel, which right now I'm not coupled to the fifth wheel But if I were getting ready to take off and I was coupled I tell you what guys that's that's one of my things that I double and triple check over and over because that's such an important piece to me so if I've connected, I make sure my arm is in and my safety pin is down and in, and I look visually to see that those jaws, I grasp around that, that pin. So that's, all, that's a super important thing for me, and of course you wanna make sure your lights are plugged in. Uh, and then I continue to proceed down the side of the tr truck to the trailer, and I do, then I get to the trailer wheels and I repeat the same thing that I did here in the front. And then of course checking your leaf springs because we all know it's unfortunate but we all know that there's just problems with rv springs it's a, it really is unfortunate we have a lot of rv friends we'll see videos and pictures and where brackets have totally come on welded from the frame and so if you can take care of that if you catch something while you're parked or even if you're at an rv park it's so much easier uh, to deal with than when you're alongside the highway and you have to wait for a tow truck and things of that nature so Definitely take a look at that, and then I work my way up the passenger side, all the way around, and then I get to the part, after I've done that, then I get to the part where I put air pressure in all my tires. So I'll grab my Viair air compressor, that's something that we use, that's also in our Amazon store, I can leave a link for that. Super handy, super portable, and I'll go around and do all the tires and make sure they are all at their safe and proper PSI. And then from there I move on to the engine compartment. And with the engine compartment, this is just basic engine oil, coolant level, uh, the condition of the hoses, power steering fluid, windshield wiper fluid, and then you're checking your, your belt and your hoses for any leaks. So pretty, pretty basic there. Then after that, I start the engine, and then what you're doing there is you're listening for any strange sounds. Um, you're looking at your oil pressure gauges, you're checking your voltmeter, your coolant temperatures, oil pressure, and any warning lights that may come up, all pretty basic with that. After that comes up, then I, I go back outside again and I check all the lights. I turn on the lights, turn on the four-way flashers, and just make sure my headlights work, high beams, low beams. Um, Chris and I will tandem that so that I have somebody, either I'm in the truck or she's in the truck, or I'm doing the lights, you know, vice versa, however you wanna do it. Uh, check and I'm, I make sure I walk down and I make sure that all of my running lights are all running even on the fifth wheel. I check my, my blinker marker. We happen to have a, a blinker marker on the side. I make sure that they're all working. Again, these are very important uh, lights because they talk to people, they communicate to people. Hey, I'm getting over, hey, I'm, I'm merging. So you wanna make sure you have all of your lights in place.
right, so next I want to talk with you guys about some driving tips. These are some driving tips that I have learned by going through driving school, and I even went through a UPS driving school. And again, these are just some basic things that I've applied uh, to driving an F450 and a fifth wheel. So really great things that maybe you can put into practice too. So there are two words that best describe defensive driving, and that is space and visibility. So it's really important, first of all, to keep your eyes moving. And the principle is, you know, you scan, don't stare. Which I know sounds basic, but we also know that there are tons of rubberneckers out there that they see somebody pulled over, you know, and then the car starts to go the way. So it's really important to always keep scanning as you're driving. I mean, you're constantly looking at your gauges, you're looking at your mirrors. So scan, don't stare. I, that's a really great principle. And then leave yourself and out. Um, always leave space on all four sides, but especially in front. I mean, that's something that, because, you know, you can't stop these things on a dime either, just like you can't stop a big rig on a dime. So always leave yourself and out. Don't tailgate people. So, and then make sure they see you, which, which sounds kind of crazy because you're like, well, this is 44 feet long, 13 feet high. What do you mean by that? I think it's always important for people to see you. So we run headlights um, when we go down the road. Um, and then if you're in a town and somebody pull out, tap that horn, that's another way to communicate to people as well as blinkers. And then of course, make eye contact with people. You know, a lot of times people are looking through windshields at each other, so it's really important to do that as well. So, and then the other thing is stay back and see it all. So when you see a bunch of vehicles bunched up, my rule of thumb is, is five or more. I'll kind of sit back from that group and kind of let them do their thing because to just be in a hurry to get up and run with five, 10 cars in a pack and where you got all kinds of things can happen, all it takes is for one of those vehicles to slam on their brakes, swerve over into your lane, and the whole pack is being taken out. So to me, I like to stay back, even if I have to slow down and I'm not even going the speed limit until that pack of cars starts to kind of break up. And then if somebody's going slow, then I'll properly lay and change and go around it. But it's just not worth it. Again, it's not worth it for you and your passengers and, and you know, your investment that you got pulling behind you. So I just kind of stay back and, and just got to go slow. Another thing of going slow, like we'll usually go about five miles an hour less than the speed limit because slow and steady wins the race, as they say. So we're not in a big hurry. And it also saves on fuel costs. So maybe some of you guys do that. And then another one that I live by for a driving tip is always, if you can, try to avoid backing up at all costs unless you have to. So if you are going to do that and you have to back up, I turn on my four-way flashers. You'll see a lot of big riggers, that they do the same thing. Again, it's kind of communicating to somebody that I'm moving and, and seeing those blinking lights kind of gets people's attention. If you need to, get a spotter and have a spotter help and always go slow if you have to. Don't be in a hurry when you're backing up because you don't know the car could come out of nowhere and bam, there you are. So the slower you go, if you had to put on your brakes, you know, you can do it a lot quicker. So just take your time and go slow. So what if you break down on the highway? So the obvious answer is, well, you have to pull over, right? So pull over, be safe, get over as far as you can, and then put on your four-way flashers and then again, you want to communicate a message to everybody around you that I'm broke down. So a lot of people will just put on their four-way flashers and they'll just sit there. But that's, that's kind of communicating, okay, I'm broke down, but, but you put the hood up. Now that's communicate. even if there's nothing wrong with your engine, that still communicates to everybody around you like, oh, okay, they're broke down. Like they're not, they're not going anywhere. So you got your four-way flashers on, you got your hood up. Those are two communications. And then your third one is going to have your reflective triangles or flares, or they have LED flares too, which that's what Chris and I have. So then you want to get those out. Again, now this is all communication because you're a sitting duck, right? And we talked about earlier about rubbernecking. So a lot of people, you see a lot of police, policemen get pulled, pull, pull people over and everybody's watching in the vehicles. I don't know if you've seen some of those and boom, they hit police cars. Policemen have to had to jump out of the way. So you're trying to communicate a message to everybody like, please get over into the passing lane because we're broke down. So what's the principle of setting your triangle? So the first thing you want to do is your first one needs to go 10 feet off your back bumper of your rig. And then from there, it goes back 100 feet. And then from there, it's 200 feet. So you can just pace it off, walk it off, and then put it in a, in a pattern that's 
sending a message. Again, you're communicating to go out and go around. So you want to stagger them, right? So people go, okay, I, I need to go around. Again, it's, it's communication. If you happen to be on a hill or you happen to be at a corner, your last one needs to start at probably about 400 feet away because people can't see, right? Because they got that corner, they got a hill, but they'll see that sitting there and that'll communicate, hey, there's a car that's broke down coming up around the corner or as I get up over the crest of a hill. So again, you're communicating something uh, to somebody and that's, that's super important. So the other thing, what you need to make sure that you do is that you have your safety gear in your truck. So I just talked about the triangles or flares or, or the LED triangles. Uh, just make, make sure you have them. Make sure you have some spare fuses as well. And then Chris and I have vests. Again, this is all communicating something to people as they're going around you saying, hey, I'm here, look at me, please, please go around. And I know some people, you know, will still stay in that same lane and they won't get over, but you're hoping that people, you know, will get over and, and get out of your way. All right, so the next thing you should be thinking about is proper distancing when you're going down the highway. So the rule of thumb is that one second for every 10 feet of your vehicle. So we're 63 feet, so for us that's six seconds. And then they say if you're going over 40 miles an hour, then you need to just add one more second to that. So that's your proper spacing as you're going down the highway. So that's just a rule of thumb that you can go by. The biggest thing next is I want to talk about is knowing the height of your vehicle. And earlier we played a video um, where people didn't know how tall they were versus what they just saw, you know, that overhead. And, and sometimes it's not even posted. So, I mean, the biggest thing is, is if you're coming up on something and you don't think you're going to fit, then pull over <laughs> and stop and don't, don't try to make it fit going, well, let's just roll the dice and just go see. Uh, better to be safe than sorry. So um, we're 13 feet, six inches tall. That's with the air conditioners. So I know some people will just do just the size of their fifth wheel from the ground to the top of their fifth wheel. I went up on the fifth wheel and measured the air conditioners on top of what it was to the top of our fifth wheel so I knew exactly what it was. So if you haven't done that, I recommend that you do that all the way up to your tallest thing on the top, which is usually your air conditioner. So that's just a good rule of thumb to have. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about, I told you guys we got a lot of stuff we're gonna talk about today. Um, this is something that happens more than what you think, and, and it's a subject that I don't think is really talked about a whole lot, uh, but Chris and I had it come up on our trip uh, to Wisconsin, so I thought it'd be a great thing to discuss today. Um, but I've seen this happen at truck stops, it can happen with school bus drivers, and that's called tail swing. And a lot of us forget about the tail swing. So if you're cranking hard left, you're gonna have the rear of your vehicle is gonna kick out far right. And if you're not positioned right, whether it's a tree, whether it's a parked car, whether it's a, a gas pump, whether it's a fellow RVer and you're at a truck stop or a rest area or, or whatever, you're gonna have tail swing. And the axle, what it'll do is it'll pivot on the middle axle from there and then the tail kicks out. Now, so a lot of drivers, when you drive a big rig, will slide the axles up because when you're around the city you want to be able to to turn a lot of sharp corners which is good um, but you got to remember that you're going to have that tail swing that's still going to be swinging out wide just like a school bus the axle is up high so even they have to worry about tail swing as well so rvs all the axles are up further so a good rule of thumb so that you kind of give yourself somewhat of a visual is to take a tape measure and measure from your you know the center uh, of your axle then all the way back to the rear so that you know so like we're like at 13 feet we have three axles so from the center axle where it pivots on it's like 13 feet to 12 feet that's what kind of I keep that mentally in my mind that's what's swinging out so I got to remember when I'm if I turn too sharp there's a good chance that I might take something out so let me give you our scenario so we recently went to an RV park that we have never stayed at before uh, it was a pull through site we told the people all our dimensions. So they knew we were 44 feet long, 13 feet, six inches high, and they assured us that you are gonna fit in our pull through site. Now this is after we had driven for like 13 hours or more in the rain and like we were just ready for a break. So we were looking forward to getting to this campground so we could just do a one night overstop and then cover our next day. So when we got back in the site, we quickly found out that we were not gonna fit in that site. So, 
here's a scenario where you know you start to feel that tension you know kind of a thing i made my assessment and i told chris i said there's there's no way that we're going to fit in this site could i make it work i probably could have made it work but doing it safely no so i'm just one of those guys if i can't do it safely now i just call it i just made a call even though we were tired and exhausted and we really wanted to stop it was not going to be worth all the finagling that i was going to have to do to try to get into that site so when you get in those moments it's just good to just kind of go slow you know don't don't get all you know tensed up and in a hurry take your time so what i did is is we assessed the plan to get to get out and and that's what led me to the subject because leaving the site there was a big tree to my right and on the left was a parked car that belonged to the RV next to us in that site. And these sites were super close together. So I had a car on one side, I had a tree, you know, on the other side. Well, guess what? On that tree, I pointed it out to Chris. I said, look at this. And there was all kinds of just rub and paint marks all up and down that tree. And so I told Chris, I said, this has got a lot of people in their tail swing. So even when I had to maneuver out of it, I had to get myself positioned over far enough to the left so that when I pulled out, I could cut the wheels tight and not have to worry about the tail swing taking out that tree. So fortunately, you know, I have some experience in, in dealing with that, but I also learned that some of my fellow RVs didn't have that experience. Um, so they had some skid marks, you know, down the sides of their trailers and, and hopefully it didn't too, do too much damage. So. I just wanted to talk about that, something that you need to be aware of because there's lots of scenarios that happen, but tail swing is something that you have to watch out for. And I found this video, I drove for UPS, so watch this video. So I hope playing that video for you really helps show tail swing and proper being properly aligned. So just something for you to be conscious about. And I wanted to bring that up to you just because of that experience that we had. All right, I saved the best topic for last. And this is one that you guys have written in to me for. And you've asked me this question and I thought, hey, let's talk about this because I don't think there's a lot of people talking about this, and that is this question. Should RVers be required to have a CDL license? And I think there's some validity um, to that because I've went through two different UPS driving training school. And anyway, just to get my CDL license. So I can tell you that I've put a lot of that to use, and that's really helped me with the size rig that we pull. But like you guys know, right now, if you can write a check or get a loan, you can go into... To, camping world or wherever and you could be driving a 40 foot class a and maybe you've never even driven one you know you could be pulling a, a 42 44 foot toy hauler and you've never pulled one before so i think there is a little bit of, of validity to that so i kind of did a little bit of research out there and i did find out that there are rv driver training schools out there that i didn't see a lot of them but there are some out there so something that you could look up to see if that's in in your area um, but maybe, maybe there should be an endorsement that we get put on our license where we have to do a, a driver's course, I don't know, to say that you can pull or drive something over 40 foot long, maybe it's, it's a weight thing. Um, I hate to see, you know, kind of big government, you know, c come into the RV arena and take it over, but I also would love to see safety out there too on the roads and, and people that kind of know how to handle vehicles. I know we've been to RV parks where people have asked me to back in their RV because they can't do it and they don't know how. And with the boom of 2020, the RV boom of 2020 to 2021, there's a lot of people who purchased RVs that have never pulled trailers before. So I think it, it has some validity to it. So speaking of research, I also did some research and you guys know how laws are. They can change, you know, by the minute. So please do your own research on this. But I looked up just to see what in other states, what what are the requirements, you know, for CDL? Is there a fine line or how are they 
how are they viewing it? So this is what I found, that Arkansas, Connecticut, Hawaii, Kansas, Nevada, South Carolina, Washington, D.C., they require a CDL if your gross vehicle weight rating is over 26,000 pounds. Um, Wisconsin requires you to have a CDL if your RV is over 45 feet long. And then Illinois, they require you to have one if you're over 16,000 pounds or towing over 10,000 pounds. Now some, so I, you know, some people have asked me, well, I don't live in any of those states. So if I drive through that state, do I have to get some special license? And, and from what I understand from the research that I've done, whatever your state requirement is, that's what you have to have. So if they don't require you to have a CDL, you don't have to worry about having a CDL driving through anybody else's state. So like I said, the laws change all the time, so I have no idea. So please do the research in your area to find out if you have to have a CDL license or not. But I would love to know your thoughts. So please write in and let us know what your thoughts are. Leave a comment below. I'd love to know. I think it's a great discussion uh, or a great debate. So again, I want to thank you guys for watching today. I know I covered a lot of information, but I really do appreciate it. I appreciate all of you new subscribers who are following along with our channel. And if you're watching this for the first time and you haven't subscribed, we'd ask for you to please subscribe. Hit that subscribe button, tap the notification button, and every time we post a video, you'll receive a notification. And with that, I say God bless and safe travels.